This audio is brought to you by Muslim Central. Please consider donating to help cover our running costs and future projects by visiting www.muslimcentral.com forward slash donate. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. Wa usalli wa usallimu ala al-mab'uuthi rahmatan lil alameen. Nabiyyina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa ashabihi. ومن اهتدى بهديه واقتدى بسنته إلى يوم الدين وبعد فقد قال جل وعلا في كتابه المجيد وفرقانه الحميد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وإذ قال موسى لقومه استعينوا بالله واصبروا إن الأرض لله يورثها من يشاء من عباده والعاقبة للمتقين قالوا أوذينا من قبل أن تأتينا ومن بعد ما جئتنا قال عسى ربكم أن يهلك عدوكم ويستخلفكم في الأرض فينظر كيف تعملون صدق الله العظيم Honorable scholars, respected brothers, elders, mothers and the esteemed listeners over the respective radio stations and receivers There can be no two opinions on the fact that we are very swiftly making our way towards Qiyamah. And every new day unveils another prophecy of the Prophet ﷺ. We speak about promiscuity that has become the order of the day. The Messenger ﷺ has made mention in the narration of Hakim that people will indulge blatantly, brazenly in immorality and promiscuity that a person who will muster the courage to tell the man that listen brother you're doing what you're doing but this is not in keeping with good mannerism in good values can you kindly excuse yourself from the pathway and don't be so brazen about your wrong go to the side and do whatever you want to the person who will muster the courage to tell the person to move aside he would be like the Abu Bakr of that time he would be like the Abu Bakr of that time. We see the rebellion of children happening day in and day out. We see so much dissension and division amongst us. Just two days ago, a good friend of mine was visiting from California, a scholar. I had spent three Ramadans there back in the early 2000s and late 90s. So we had developed a great relationship. So we were just chatting and he was updating me and keeping up me to speed with, with events and developments there. It's been a period that I haven't been to that site in, in California. He said recently there was a janazah that was brought. An elderly man had passed on. His two sons came and they're standing outside. So we addressed them and we said, please come in and assist in the rituals of ghusl for your dad. And we went in in anticipation that they would come. 15 minutes, 20 minutes, half an hour passes by. He just mentioned this to me yesterday and they wouldn't come in. So we opened the door and we went out and said, please, your father's corpse and body is lying here. So they said, you know, we, myself and my brother don't speak for 12 years. If he's coming to wash, I won't wash. And if he goes, I won't come. 12 years, we're not speaking to the extent that they couldn't swallow their differences momentarily to respect the dead body of their father. He said, we tried to convince them that understand this is not how you deal with the body of your late father. So every prophecy of the Messenger وسلم, stares us in our eyes. But probably there's one that we have spoken about less comparatively. And for some strange reason, Allah has put it in my mind today to address this. Probably elections looming as well. There's a tie and there's a relevance to that. And that is one of the prophecies the Messenger وسلم, said, إِذَا وُسِّدَ الْأَمْرُ إِلَىٰ غَيْرِ أَهْلِ One of the signs of Qiyamah is, undeserving people will embrace posts. From a micro to a macro, from a domestic to global, from institutions to political posts, each one will be vying and competing and saying, listen, put me in office, give the reins to me, I have skill, I have, I have muscle, I have clout. Yet when you will look at their lives, there won't be a fiber of morality in them. I'm not profiling or microscopically analyzing everyone, anyone. I'm talking on a general note. We have talks on the signs of Qiyamah and we speak about the consumption of alcoholism and drugs and, and, and related evils. And it's imperative. I'm not trivializing the need to address this. But when we look at the signs of Qiyamah, there is also mention that people will come into prominent posts 
but they won't have anything to lead the ummah. They will have no muscle or clout or strength to guide the ship of this ummah. The Prophet ﷺ said, the hadith is in Bukhari, Sayyidina Huzaifa radiallahu anhu said, during the Messenger ﷺ's time, I could deal with anyone. If I needed to enter into a transaction, if he was a believer, his faith would compel him to be candid, honest and transparent. I didn't need to do any checks and balances, any references on a man. He's a Muslim, it's fine. Today, my brother, and forgive me, and I'm the first person that doesn't deserve the post that I'm sitting here. It's not sufficient if he's a Muslim, nor is it sufficient if he imbibes the Quran in his chest and bosom, nor is it sufficient if he has the feather of being a pilgrim, nor is it sufficient if he has any knowledge or any diploma to his degree. You need to look at each case individually and see the merits of the case. There is no longer any qualification in the life of a person or any supposed association to nobility that can sanction the activities of people. In fact, I often say, and may Allah guide me in what I say, many people associate themselves to pious people only to endorse their unsavory activities. Many people associate, no, no, he's good, he's great, he's got affiliation, association with so-and-so person. Huzaifa ibn Yaman radiallahu anhu says that during the time of the Prophet sallallahu I could deal with anybody. In Kana Muslima, if he was a believer, his faith, his iman, his consciousness of his creator. Ala innahum yathnoon sudurahum li yastaghfu min ala hina yastaghshoon thiyabahum ya'lamu ma yusirroon wa ma yu'linoon When you look at the galaxy of Sahaba, and this is taqwa, and only taqwa can govern a person. You have a, you have a camera, you have security, you have a monitor, you have a police force. But the question is, who monitors the police? Who polices the police? Who's the guardian over the guardian? I read an article in one of the African states that the anti-corruption unit was the most corrupt. The anti-corruption unit was the most corrupt. The Sahaba, this is the concluded verse of the 11 Jews. It's the first page of Surah Hud. In Tafsir Uthmani under this ayah, with reference to Bukhari, the quotation of Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anhuma is mentioned. Look at when a person fears his creator. Sahaba, when they would change their clothing, there are different opinions. This is one Tafsir, it's the Tafsir of Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhuma. They would literally crouch down and bend forward and cover themselves concealing their private organs out of modesty and morality and bashfulness that when I'm removing my clothing, my private area is being exposed to Allah. Again, look at the beauty of the Quran. When Adam and Eve ate from the forbidden tree and the first injunction of prohibition of eating something unlawful dates back to Jannah. Dates back to Jannah. In Jannah there was no other injunction other than don't eat. So the ulama say the ruling of abstaining from forbidden food goes right back to Jannah. When our parents were told to stay away from, from this tree and they ate, the immediate result of it was their private area became exposed. Sahib Jalalain writes in Arabic we refer to private area as sawat. If you do little etymology and linguistics of the word, sawat is the plural of the word sawatun. Sawatun is from the word sa'ayasu'u, which loosely translates as evil. Look at the beauty of the Arabic language. Why is the private area known as sawa? Because revealing it, exposing it, would be not palatable, would not be pleasant to a man of sanity and integrity. A person of morality, he will be uncomfortable. How many of us frequent the gym? It's just the norm, it's just the way it happens. You go in a change room and that's, that's how it happens. I haven't been there, I've been told. No, no, your mind starts running. It's just casual, it's okay, there's nothing much about it. You know, you just say, لا تنظر إلى فخذ حي ولا ميت Our faith in two words is a faith of simplicity and morality. If somebody asks you in a passing, tell me Islam, put Islam in two words. It's a faith that is simple, 
simplicity. We, we do things. We get married also. We have functions also, but it's simple. And we do things, but it must be done with morality. So anyway, the Sahaba, out of their consciousness of Allah, they would drop down and they would crouch. And then Allah revealed the verse that there's no need to impose on yourself such stringent measures. Surely even when you conceal or you cover your private organs to Allah, it's still exposed. But look at their consciousness. In the 18 Juz, in Surah Nur, look at this. What did Huzaifa ibn Yaman radiallahu said in the focus of my talk? is on the signs of Qiyamah, we're undeserving people. And th we don't have a succession plan. And even if we have succession plans, I'm afraid those that are coming onto the seat, from our organizations, to our institutions, to political arenas, to the global stage. Just look at the world has become barren. It's just become dry. It's, it's, there's no more meaning, there's no more value. You, 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 just, you just pry or probe or scratch or you eavesdrop into the life of any person. And you'll be appalled, you'll be appalled to see what's behind the scenes. The consciousness of Allah, the alertness of Allah. When they used to sit and eat, so each person would have that level of consciousness of Allah. The crippled Sahabi said, no, I cannot eat with the healthy Sahabi. Why? Because I have a disability and I occupy the seat of two. The healthy Sahabi said, we cannot jointly eat with a cripple because due to his disability, he'll arrive late. Probably we have half eaten the food. The visually impaired said, I cannot eat with the sighted because I have no measure I can consume more than my allotted. The sighted Sahabi said, I cannot consume commonly from with a blind Sahabi simply because he will eat less. The healthy Sahabi said, I cannot eat with a sick one. He doesn't have an appetite. His health is not good. And this was the kind of taqwa in the life of each person. That I'm, am I not infringing, encroaching, violating, offending? Today you can snub a man. You can tell him a dirty word. You can offend him. You can demoralize him and just walk on. It means nothing. Allah revealed the verse. لَيْسَ عَلَى الْأَعْمَى حَرَجْ وَلَا عَلَى الْأَعْرَجِ حَرَجْ وَلَا عَلَى الْمَرِيضِ حَرَجْ وَلَا عَلَى أَنفُسِكُمْ أَن تَأْكُلُوا مِنْ بُيُوتِكُمْ Oh my Sahaba, we acknowledge your taqwa and we appreciate your consciousness. But there's no need to exert yourself to that level and cause pain and uneasiness and stress your relationship out. Huzaifa ibn Yaman radiallahu anhu said during the time of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, I could speak to anyone, deal with anyone, you want to buy it, it's fine. If he was a believer, his faith would compel him to honesty. If he, were dis if he was a disbeliever, society will expose him. Today society will give him amnesty. Society will harbor him. Society will give him protection. That is where it has become. Where things, when normal things become abnormal, abnormal becomes normal. If he was a disbeliever, society will expose him. He said, time has moved on, and now I am very selective with whom I deal. La ubayi'u illa fulanan wa fulanan wa fulanan. And then he went on to say that the Prophet wasallam said, a time will come that honesty, loyalty, fidelity will become such a rare commodity that it will stand out. Hatta yuqal anna fi bani fulan rajulan amina. People will travel the length and breadth of continents to come and meet a man. Brother, I've traveled to come and meet you. I've been told that, uh, mashallah, you're honest. You know, you've got a skill, you have an art, you have charisma, you have a gift. People come to you. People will travel continents to come and meet a man. Listen, I've heard that, mashallah, you've never spoken a lie. I've been, I've been dying to see you. I've been really anxious to see you. I, I'm really, I'm, I've never seen an honest man in my life, and this is the first person I meet him. That is how rare honesty, loyalty will become. Hatta yuqal anna fi bani fulanin rajulan amina. So tragically we find ourselves in a situation like this, where those that have come into position and power, by and large, there might be few that are the exception, and may Allah preserve them and protect them and guide them. But on a general note, on a general note, I'm afraid this sign of qiyamah, where undeserving people have taken post, stares us in our eyes. During the reign of Umar ibn Abdul Aziz, the second Umar, 
who brought a new definition to justice, read his rich legacy. In Tafsir Kabir, there's an incident mentioned that during the reign of Umar ibn Abdul Aziz, a shepherd came with his flock to the well. And while he was bringing his flock, a wolf came by. And the wolf and the sheep are drinking from a common well. And a passerby said, Mata shat. But this is strange. This is unheard of. When did you see sheep and wolf drink from a common well? He said, Hina ra'i ma'a When the shepherd made peace with his creator, then the creation made peace amongst themselves. When the shepherd made peace with his creator. So Umar ibn Abdul Aziz's error was just an error like you cannot believe and imagine. When he took post, when he took post, and he took office, and the ayat al karima that I recited alludes to the same fact. That Sayyidina Musa said to his people, Qala Musa li ista'inu billahi wasbiru, ista'inu billah, seek help from Allah, wasbiru and persevere. Often in the Quran, the remedy to crisis, Allah says, is persevere. Today for a young man, the option of hanging on, persevering, give it time, let's wait, let's see, it's just not an option. I need to have it done now, do or die, make or break, on or off, it needs to happen or not. Ista'inu, seek the help of Allah, wasbiru, wasbiru, just hang on, restrain yourself, give it time, don't be so emotional, don't be so impulsive, don't dissolve, just, just give it time, the marriage will stabilize. إِنَّ الْأَرْضَ لِلَّهِ The land belongs to Allah. يُورِثُهَا مَنْ يَشَاءُ مِنْ عِبَادِهِ Allah will inherit the land to whomsoever He wishes. وَالْعَاقِبَةُ لِلْمُتَّقِينَ And the noble outcome are for those who fear Allah. So then, Bani Israel say, قَالُوا أُوذِينَا مِنْ قَبْلِ أَنْ تَأْتِيَنَا وَمِنْ بَعْدِ مَا جِئْتَنَا O Moses, we were, we suffered pain, difficulty, prior to your delegation prior to your prophethood and even post your prophethood. Sayyidina Musa a.s. responded by saying, عَسَى رَبُّكُمْ أَنْ يُهْلِكَ عَدُوَّكُمْ وَيَسْتَخْلِفَكُمْ It is highly possible that Allah will annihilate and destroy your foe and your enemy. And then Allah will give you power and authority. And remember, power is never the aim. فَيَنْظُرَ كَيْفَ تَعْمَلُونَ Allah wants to see how do you manage yourself in the seat of power. It's easy, my brother, to criticize and condemn and say those that are there are doing this or that. But when you find yourself in the position, I give a simple analogy, and I'm just using this because we all could identify. A daughter-in-law could moan and groan and object and frown. My mother-in-law is like this, is like that. Only for her to come into that position, and I'm afraid she repeats the same blunders, if not worse. Today you're an employee, you can have a mouthful of your employer. He's arrogant, he's obstinate, he's proud, he thinks the world. Allah turns the tables and Allah brings you in the power. And suddenly you employing and you running an operation and you managing the floor. And there are, there's, there's, there's so many people under your wing and under your control. Do you momentarily pause and think and ask yourself, how am I dealing with myself? Umar radiallahu anhu is probably the greatest point of reference that anybody can look to when it comes to a man in power. Sayyidina Umar radiallahu anhu is walking. While he's walking, a whisper hits him. And what's the whisper? Anta amirul mu'mineen, man da afdal minka. Umar, after all, you are great. Look at the people around you. Look at how they salute you. Look at how they honor you. There has to be something to you. So he feels that inflation of his ego. We all get those whispers. But look at how swiftly they reacted to deflate the ego. We entertain it, we fantasize it, we develop on it. And hence we develop the spiritual cancer within us. Umar radiallahu calls up an urgent meeting. People converge and congregate in the masjid. It's brimming to capacity. He said, I just want to mention to you people something about my life, which probably is unknown to many of you. In my early days, pre-Islam as a kid, I was a shepherd and I used to take the sheep. And end of the day, for grazing the flock, they would give me a handful of dates. And that was my remuneration for the day. It was like, Omar, what's the relevance? What are you talking, my brother? You know, apples with bananas. Makes sense. We're busy, we engage, we gather in the masjid. He said, as I was walking, pride came into me. And I thought the only way to deflate my ego is to make the people known, make the people aware of that aspect of my life which was simple, which was basic, which is not known to anyone. If I've wasted your time, my apologies, but for me, I have nipped it in the bud. I have addressed my pride and my arrogance. 
Allahu Akbar. What did Sayyidina Umar say when he was in his fatal illness and he was about to leave the world? And he said, I rotate my gaze and I don't see anybody who I can pass this reins over to. I really don't know who I can entrust. I really don't know who I can entrust. Look at the irony. Today a man takes office, he takes position, member, police, whatever it is, he comes into power. He says, no, no, you don't need to do any investigation over me. There's a cloud hanging over his name. There are 10 things that are pending. There is a whole, you know what, report and write up and whatever. And he says, no, no, I am good and I am the right person and I'm candid. Sayyidina Yusuf alayhi salam, when the king calls him out of the jail, he says, no, no, first investigate me. He is calling upon the investigation. I was put in the jail wrongly. That case was shut and closed. قَالَ مَا خَطْبُكُنَّ إِذْ رَاوَتُنَّ يُوسُفَ عَنْ نَفْسِ People had accused me of immorality. People had accused me that I had done some unpleasant advancements. Can you please probe that case? Can you get clarity on this? Why? So tomorrow when I come in office, nobody can have this notion that you can do wrong and corruption and still become a leader. لِيَعْلَمَ أَنِّي لَمْ أَخُنْهُ بِالْغَيْبِ وَأَنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يَهْدِي كَيْدَ الْخَائِنِينَ So people will know that the plot of treacherous will never prosper. But if I come into office with a cloud hanging over me, then you would think that is fine, anybody can take office. Sayyidina Umar said, I rotate my gaze, I don't find any person deserving. So Abdullah ibn Abbas said, what about so and so, what about so and so, what about so and so? He said, do you know what it takes to be a leader, to be a guardian, to be a pilot, to spearhead this ummah? I just have a thought in my mind, I objectively digress and I'll come back to this. The narration is in Muslim Sharif, Abdullah bin Zubair radiallahu anhu. He says, my dad called me on the eve of the battle of Jamal. We're not going into the details of the battle of Jamal. That's again my pain and I say it often in my talks. The ummah is not reading. A nation whose first revelation was Iqra read has become nothing to do with Islamic literature. Nothing of reading. We've lost the touch. I was in, 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 in Dublin in Ramadan and we were having Seri there and one brother told me, he says, I, I've done some research on phones and networks and, and uh, you know, all the other, um, uh, you know, innovation and, and technology. And he said, one of the most disturbing things uh, of, of modern technology, and he supported it with all his research, etc. I said, you know what, it's Seri time, brother, go slow, man, you need to be easy. Generally, some people, they come with tough questions at the time of eating. Hakim al-Ummah said, you must talk gentle and light. Now you sit down to eat, you're a visitor, and they want to ask you, what's your opinion on this complex ruling? Let's digest the food, brother. Let's digest the food. Be gentle, be mild, be passive, be light, be easy. Light on the, on, on the abdomen, light on the digestive system. When there is a sitting for it, dedicate that question at that time. There's, there's time, there's moments, there's opportunity, there's occasions. Anyway, be it as it may, he said that human psychology, when, when a person receives some disturbing news, probably a tragedy, an accident, a hiccup, a glitch, a snag, a death, whatever it is, the mind takes time to digest it, it settles in your mind, and then you consciously, first you deny it, then you embrace it, and then you start responding. Listen, there's been an accident, there's been a death, you send out notifications, you cry, you mourn, you wail, you break down. But he said, today our technology is such that we are receiving contradicting messages simultaneously, not allowing our body to settle into any news. So you get in one news of a death and a tragedy, then suddenly you get in a news that a, a team that you support won, then you get in the news that the currency has, 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 has dropped again, then you get in the news that your son has excelled, then you get in the news that your daughter-in-law is about to give birth, then you get in the news that your flight has been delayed, can you imagine this here? It has consumed, it has overtaken us. The body doesn't have the capacity, the psychology doesn't have the ability to manage this, to control this. And this is creating erratic patterns in the mind and the brain. Allahu Akbar. The article of Khalid Baig, I quote often, he said, We are a nation blessed and cursed by our innovation. We are a nation blessed and cursed by our innovation. Anyway, Abdullah bin Zubair radiallahu anhu says, My dad calls me on the eve of the battle. On the eve of the battle. When you said there were people with, with muscle, with clout, with vigor, with authority, who were taking, you know, the, the reins of the ummah. 
and the kind of people that will succeed in them will live in up to that mark. He said, my boy, I'm seeing you, but I don't think we're going to be making again. I'm leaving now. So just listen to me quickly. There's few things you need to attend to. On the eve, the father is calling in five minutes. He writes out his whole estate. He explains everything. He delegates his son and he sighs with relief that this boy will execute everything I have entrusted. What was the maturity of the youth of that time? He says to him, You know, the thing that haunts me the most are my deaths. He's going in the path of Allah. He says, I'm going to be martyred. The narration is in Muslim. He's a devout companion of the Prophet ﷺ. He says, but there's something that leaves me uneasy and that's my deaths. I have no accolades to my name. I have no credit to my account. I have no virtues and no merit. And yet I am casual and easy about my deaths. It's fine, it's easy, it's going, it doesn't bother much. The Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi said, the narration is in Tirmidhi, Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min al-kufri wa dayn Oh my Lord, protect me from disbelief and from death. The scholars of hadith, they analyze the gravity of a wrong or the significance of an injunction in relation to where Allah mentions it or where Allah couples it, where Allah pays it. By, 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 by way of example, Allah speaks about monotheism, worship in one Allah, and Allah couples that injunction with kindness to parents. And the Quran is brimming with this. وَقَضَى رَبُّكَ أَلَّا تَعْبُدُوا إِلَّا إِيَّاهُ وَبِالْوَالِدَيْنِ إِحْسَانًا Worship one Allah, be kind to your parents. وَإِذْ أَخَذْنَا مِيثَاقَ بَنِي إِسْرَائِيلَ لَا تَعْبُدُونَ إِلَّا اللَّهَ وَبِالْوَالِدَيْنِ إِحْسَانًا When we took the pledge and the covenant from the Israelites that worship none but Allah, the Mufassirin say, يَا لَا تَعْبُدُونَ النَّفِيزِ in the meaning of Nahi, أَيْ لَا تَعْبُدُوا Do not worship anyone but Allah, وَبِالْوَالِدَيْنِ إِحْسَانًا And be kind to your parents, so on and so forth. فَجَتَنِبُوا الرِّجَسَ مِنَ الْأَوْثَانِ وَجَتَنِبُوا قَوْلَ الزُّورِ Abstain from idol worship and abstain from speaking a lie. Allah couples the prohibition of uttering a lie with idolatry that gives you an indication of the gravity of speaking a lie that it has been paired up with such a severe offense. Here the Prophet of Allah is asking Allah, Allah save me from kufr and save me from deaths. A sahabi quizzes the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, engages him. أَتَعْدِلُ الْكُفْرَ بِالدَّيْنِ Prophet ﷺ, are we saying that disbelief and deaths are on the same level, on the same line? You're asking Allah protection from disbelief, I identify, and then from deaths, in one breath, one voice. The Messenger ﷺ said, yes, they are together. The scholars of hadith, may Allah preserve them. The scholars of hadith, read, read our deen and read our hadith. There's so much written in the books of hadith. And that is when you appreciate the scholars, and that is the preservation of our deen. They say, why? When a person has overwhelming debts, and he has commitments, and he cannot meet those commitments, he would resort to any measure to generate that revenue, be it legitimate or illegitimate, whether it, confine, whether it conforms with the legislative teachings of Islam, or it violates the teachings of Islam, whether it's permissible or impermissible, legitimate or illegitimate, whether he has to go to a gambling den and pull a machine and play a slot, or whether he has to go online gambling, whatever it is, as long as I can make that money and meet my bills, even if I lose my faith in the process. So he says, oh my son, the thing that worries me the most are my debts, and then you must take care of my debts, and بِئْمَالِي وَقْضِ دَيْنِي وَأَوْصَى بِالثُلُثِ وَثُلُثِهِ لِبَنِيهِ A third, and then one third of that for your children, فَإِنْ فَضُلَ عَنْ مَالِنَا شَيْءٍ If anything is left behind, then this is how you would execute it. And then, and then, I... Uh, uh, I read this and I cry, and I said, I wish, and I wish, and I wish. And I promise you, if you take this to heart, this itself is profound. He said, listen, my son, time is running out. I'm going, it's the eve, the battle is starting, the intensity is increasing, I need to move. Please take care, I won't see you again, we meet in Akhirah. But after I'm gone, if you have any gripes, any issues, any glitches, feel free to call upon my master at any time. Feel free to call. Abdullah radiallahu anhu said, my dad is throwing this on me, I'm still digesting, what at a time, we're dead, slow, slow, what are you saying? 
حتى قلت ومن مولاك والله ما دريت ما أراد حتى قلت يا أبتي ومن مولاك Dad, you said I must speak to your master. You, you, you just want to elucidate and elaborate who is your master and what's the reference. He said, oh my son, none other than my Allah. Imagine leaving behind such a bond, such a relationship with your creator that you can tell your children, oh my children, I haven't left behind much in monetary or assets. But I have left a relationship with my creator. You can call on him to attend to any of my matters and he will respond due to the relation I enjoy with him. قَالَ فَوَاللَّهِ مَا وَقَعْتُ فِي كُرْبَةٍ مِّن دَيْنِهِ إِلَّا قُلْتُ يَا مَوْلَ الزُّبَيرِ اِقْضِ عَنْهُ دَيْنَهُ By Allah, this was not lip service. This was not a pie in the sky. This was a hard reality. When my dad moved on and I attended to the rituals of burial and we took care of it, and then whenever I had any crisis, I just said to say, Oh, the Lord of Zubair, attend to the affairs of Zubair. An instant divide aid would come to my rescue. Imagine that relationship you have with your Allah. The, 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 the tale in Surah Kahf of those two youth. وكان تحته كنز لهما وكان أبوهما صالحا وكان أبوهما صالحا وأما الجدار with regards to the tree which the, the, the wall which خذر straightened up فكان لغلامين يتيمين beneath that wall there was a treasure that belonged to two orphans and Allah deputed and delegated خذر alayhi salam to go and straighten the wall lease it collapses and the treasures become exposed and somebody snatches it but in the quran says why did allah take additional measure to secure insulate protect the the treasures wa kana abuhuma saliha their late father was a man who had a relationship with allah their late father was a pious man and through the agency and through the piety and the nobility of that man, Allah took care of his children. And Muhammad ibn Munkadir, the Tabi'i's narration is mentioned, إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يَحْفَظُ بِالرَّجُلِ الصَّالِحِ وَلَدَهُ وَوَلَدَ وَلَدِهِ Allah protects, Allah protects by virtue of the piety, the, his children and his grandchildren and often his neighborhood as well. Anyway, we were speaking about the words of Sayyidina Umar radiallahu anhu. He said, I rotate my gaze, I see nobody deserving. So then he said to Abdullah ibn Abbas, do you know what qualities, what attributes you need to lead this ummah in any capacity? He said, قَوِيٌّ مِنْ غَيْرِ عُنْفٍ These words make me cry. لَيِّنٌ مِنْ غَيْرِ ضُعْفٍ جَوَّادٌ مِنْ غَيْرِ صَرْفٍ مُمْسِكٌ مِنْ غَيْرِ بُخْلٍ You need somebody who is strong, but is not harsh. Somebody who is layin, who is soft, but is not weak. Jawad, someone who's generous but not extravagant. Mumsik, someone who can withhold but he doesn't mise. Those are the qualities that are needed to become a ruler and a man in power and in office. The very same Sayyidina Umar, he's walking, he's walking. Iyas ibn radiallahu makes mention of it. Sayyidina Umar is walking and then Sayyidina Umar used to walk with meaning, with integrity. If people were walking slow and sluggish, he used to nudge them. Are you sick? No. Then walk fast. You know, there must be meaning in your walk. There mustn't be lethargy in your walk. There must be... A, a believer is one who when he walks, you can see he has commitment, he has vision, he has spoken, focus. There's, there's an object in his life. You, 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 would, you would be appalled to see how many a youth and how many people can, can just pass their day to day. I fly often. And you see prominent, high-profile, corporate, business class flyers. A man can sit in the plane and play games on his phone. I mean, I know there's a kid in every adult, but there's a limit. Like, like would you not exploit that time to, to optimum, whether you're reading, whether you're researching, whether you're doing work, playing games. Like, can you digest where this ummah has lost the vision of protecting time? Hassan Basri said, I seen the Sahaba. And if I have to summarize them in one sentence, it would be the following. 
كان أحدهم أشح على عمره منه على درهمه. They were very tight when it came to time, and they were very loose when it came to money. You could get any amount of money from them. You got no time from them. Today, us is the direct opposite. You ask the man for money, yeah, we'll see. Don't worry. Time, relax, brother. The night is young. The night is young. Take it easy. What, what you, what you, what you stressing about? It's a Saturday night. Go with it. Time. The ummah has lost the focus and the value of time. Mufti Taqi Uthmani was one day addressing a panel of scholars and we, he was asked to say some highlights of his late father Mufti Shafi Saab Rahmatullah Alayhi. He said, my dad when he would use the bathroom and the washroom and relieve himself, obviously when you are passing the call of nature at that time, you cannot be doing anything or rather you should not be doing anything. Because now there's a lot of things happen. He says in that time while he would squat and relieve himself, he would use those moments objectively to wash the water can in the bathroom because I am sitting, I cannot do anything. So additional time doesn't have to be taken out to clean the water can. I am relieving myself and while doing that, I can use the time objectively and take care of this. We need focus of time. The Quran or the hadith of the Prophet one hadith of the Messenger he said, لا سمرت بعد العشاء Let there be no social gatherings post Isha. Today the world is going against this very prophetic teaching because of which just see the crisis and the ripple effects in the world. So the Messenger وسلم, calls upon us, impresses upon us, retire to bed early. Don't have social discussions, don't entertain, don't chat chat, don't have gossip, don't have all these gatherings and everything. Retire to bed early and rise early. It's the direct opposite. The nightlife happens, the shops are open, the malls are buzzing, the activities are taking place. It's late hours, early night and that's what life. And the next day it's like a cemetery. Anyway, coming back to the words of Umar ibn Abdul Aziz, we were talking about him and we digressed. He's, when he took office, when Sayyidina Umar ibn Abdul Aziz rahimahullah took office, it was a tired night, the night before, because he had to attend to the funeral of Sulaiman ibn Abdul Malik. So he retired to bed, there was a butler at the door who would mend the door and he said, listen, don't allow anybody else in, don't allow anybody in. I'm tired, I, I need to have some, some fr sleep and I need to rejuvenate myself. And before he could retire to bed, there was a knock on the door. And often I cry to Allah, I, I, I'm a humble, ordinary, fallible mortal, and there are many more prominent scholars and learned people here, and may Allah preserve each one of them. I see them here, and may Allah reward you for sitting in my humble talks. Their knowledge is more than me, their experience are more than me. But you get these calls, concerns, queries, and you wish and you cry and you wonder, Allah, I wish I had the strength to respond to every call to give a talk. I wish I could answer every query. I wish I could respond to every question and every WhatsApp and every email, but I just don't have it within me. I don't have the muscle, I don't have the strength. But look at these people, look at these people. He retires to bed, there's a knock on the door. The butler opens the door, who's it? It's his son, Abdul Malik. Listen, your dad's instructions is that he's tired and he's exhausted and he had a long night. No, I need to talk to my dad. No, but please understand that your dad had a busy night, he's just retired. Now, I need to talk to him. So, after much persistence, he informs his father, Umar ibn Abdul Aziz, it's your son, Abdul Malik, and he's quite adamant that he needs to have a word with you. So he says, usher him in. He's ushered in, he's brought in. He says, Dad, you've taken office, you are now liable and you are responsible. All the injustices that were taken place before you, now this rests on your shoulder. So he says, yes, I know my son, I'm going to address this and we will take care and see how best. I just need to sleep till dhuhr. So Abdul Malik tells his father, can I whisper something in your ears? And look at this father and son. Man laka, man laka bi anta isha ila Oh my dad, I'm happy. If you say you're going to address this, sit in office and start, you know what, resolving all the disparity, discrepancy, uh, discrepancies, exploitation, and you're going to address this after Zohar, day one that you've come into. There's no inaugural bash. There's no big banquet. There's no lavish spread. There's no head of states coming in. The man is taking office and this is the responsibility. My only question to you is, who takes responsibility that you will live till Zohar Salah? Who takes responsibility, my dad? The narration goes out, 
فَأَطَارَتِ النَّوْمَ مِنْ بَيْنِ عَيْنَيْهِ That statement of this boy jolted his dad, gave him a wake-up call. And I hope my young brother, to me and to you and any man, that we can also have that wake-up call. Once and for all, we draw the line. We make a calculated choice. أَطَارَتِ النَّوْمَ مِنْ بَيْنِ عَيْنَيْهِ أَطَارَتِ النَّوْمَ مِنْ بَيْنِ عَيْنَيْهِ Fatigue, insomnia, tiredness and sleep left his eyelids for good. He then stood up. He embraced his son. It was an emotional embrace. And he said, Alhamdulillah, الذي أخرج من صلبي من يعينني على ديني. Allah, I am proud of the legacy you've created from my loin, that if I go off track, immediately they apprehend me and put me on line. Then you see the relation of, of this son and this father. Maymoon ibn Mahran says, I one day went to Umar ibn Abdul Aziz, and I seen him sitting and he was writing a letter, وَجَدْتُهُ يَكْتُبُ رِسَالَةً إِلَىٰ أَبِيهِ وَجَدْتُهُ يَكْتُبُ رِسَالَةً إِلَىٰ إِبْنِهِ He was writing a letter to his son, Abdul Malik, يَعِذُهُ فِيهَا وَيَنْصَحُهُ وَيُحَذِّرُهُ Long story, I'll just give you some extracts of it. Amazing, father and son relation. Listen, dad, you've come into office, not nepotism, secure me, anchor me, get, get myself taken care of. The narration is in Taysir al-Kareem, Fi Seerati Uthman. Taysir al-Kareem, that's the name of the kitab, I've read the reference of it. Long story short, when Sayyidina Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, when he was in his fatal illness, he had called Sayyidina Uthman radiallahu anhu and he said, Right, I'm telling you who will succeed me, who would take care of, who would come into position. So Sayyidina Uthman radiallahu anhu is writing, and Abu Bakr is dictating, Wa Abu Bakr yumli. And Sayyidina Uthman is capturing and recording, he was the scribe. And at a critical juncture, just when Abu Bakr is about to dictate the name of his successor, fate has it such that Abu Bakr passes out and he becomes unconscious. A niche that the best of us would exploit for personal interests, because it's a private closed door meeting. It was just the two of us. Abu Bakr and Sayyidina Uthman radiallahu anhu. And then Sayyidina Uthman continues furnishing and completing the form independently. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu gains consciousness. He addresses and engages Sayyidina Uthman. So what were you writing and where did we stop? He said, you were dictating the name and then you became unconscious and I took the liberty to complete the name and fill in the dots. And he said, and whose name did you write? He said, I wrote the obvious Umar ibn Khattab. I wrote the obvious Umar ibn Khattab. So Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu said, Alhamdulillah, I am so grateful to Allah that I can leave the ummah at a stage where there's no rivalry for post. Ah, oh, such a peaceful time to leave the ummah and leave at this time, to know that there's respect and dignity and, 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 and respect for each other. وَلَوْ كُنْتَ كَتَبْتَ نَفْسَ كُنْتَ لَهَا أَهْلَا And if you chose to write your name, trust me, you were no less deserving. You were no less deserving. Today, we don't have that maturity to enter into a meeting and how often I've been called in. That the father has moved on and the brothers can sit down and it's time to wind up an estate and say, listen, okay, this is my share, but I got a car, you don't have a car, I'm fine with it. You take this car, you take this car. I've got three cars and that will be my fourth car and my sibling doesn't have one car, but it's my car and it's my right and I want it. And surely it's your right, I'm not arguing. From a juristic perspective, from the rules of, of, of fiqh, it's absolutely in, you know, in order. I often mention this incident, the ulama will enjoy it. And this was the knowledge of Sayyidina Ali radiallahu anhu. A woman once came to Sayyidina Ali. But I'm saying the spirit of giving. The spirit of giving. Somebody came to ask Sayyidina Umar radiallahu anhu, you are in rulership, you're not giving me, making me in charge. Give me a post. Let me be in charge. Give me authority. The world has become so desperate today for fame and recognition. Look at, the, look at the social media. It's all about my name. I've traveled to many parts of the world and I ask Allah to accept my humble travels. In many parts of the world, people identify a scholar by how many followers he has on social media. It's like, is that, is that the grounds? Is that the credentials? Is that the yardstick? Is that the barometer with which we, we analyze the acceptance of a person? So you ask Sayyidina Umar, Ubay ibn Kaab, who was the great qari of this ummah, he said, you don't give me a post, he said, akhsha an yudannis ad-deenak. 
I'm worried if you take any position, it will taint your piety. It will blemish your character. It will compromise your nobility. Worship your Allah. Stay free from a position and do your things and move on. Do your things and move on. I was mentioning the incident of inheritance and I'll come back to Umar ibn Abdul Aziz. A woman once came to Sayyidina Ali radiallahu anhu. Inheritance is a very complex aspect of Islamic jurisprudence. But if you read the life of Sayyidina Ali, you would know the kind of knowledge Allah had blessed him. And this woman came and said, Mata akhi, My brother passed on. dirham. He left behind in his estate 600 dirhams. وَلَمْ يُقْسَمْ لِي مِنْهَا إِلَّا dirham, And I was only given one dirham out of the 600 dirhams. فَهَلْ هَذَا صَحِي Is this right? Look at the knowledge of Sayyidina Ali. He said, لَعَلَّهُ تَرَكَ أُمَّنْ لَعَلَّهُ تَرَكَ أُمَّنْ وَزَوْجَةً وَبِنْتَيْنِ وَإِثْنَيْ عَشَرَ أَخًا وَأَنْتِ If you say your brother left behind 600 dirhams and he only gave you one, that means your brother is survived by a spouse, by a mother, by two daughters, 12 brothers and one sister. He said, yeah, you're right, you're right, you're right. So well then it's right and one dirham is in order. Allahu Akbar, what was their knowledge? What was their knowledge? Then he said, it's simple. The Quran says, وَلِأَبَوَيْهِ لِكُلِّ وَاحِدٍ مِّنْهُمَ السُّدُسُ مِمَّا تَرَكَ إِنْ كَانَ لَهُ وَلَدٍ That the parents will inherit one-sixth of the wealth. So from the 600, his mom gets 100. And then the spouse, she will get, the two daughters will get two-thirds. The two daughters, two or more. فَإِن كُنَّ نِسَاءً فَوْقَ اثْنَتَيْنِ فَلَهُنَّ ثُلُثَا مَا تَرَكْ if there are two or more daughters, they will get two-thirds. So they, they get two-thirds of the 600, that is 400. 100 goes to the mother. The spouse will get one-eighth if they are children. If you have any children, your spouse will get one-eighth. One-eighth of 675. You left with 25, the brothers will get two, the sister will get one. So from 600, one, it's in order. Jazakallah, sister, that's yours. I'm saying the jizba and the desire, we cannot sit down respectfully and thrash out our differences and have the, the zeal to give one another, leave alone, you know what, to, to give over power. And remember, Imam Ghazali has written, that the ego hankers for wealth, but the ego, the ego hankers for position more than wealth. The ego hankers for wealth, but the ego hankers and yearns and pines for position more. Because often position can buy you more than what wealth can buy you. A celebrity status will buy him more than what an affluent man's wealth will buy him. His status, who is his position, that will buy him more in the world. So the ego wants recognition constantly. Recognize who I am, understand my position. In Islam, we are told, Imam Ghazali has written something so beautifully, Masidqul Qabih. There is a type of truth that Allah dislikes. There is a type of truth, truth that Allah dislikes. What is it? Thanaul Mar'i ala nafsi. Thanaul Mar'i ala nafsi. When you enumerate your own virtues, you speak about yourself, you blow your own trumpet, you might be so good. We're not refuting, but Allah dislikes when you speak about your own good. Yahya ibn Ma'in said, Sahibna Ahmad ibn Hanbal khamsina sana. Sahibna Ahmad ibn Hanbal. I stayed with Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal for 50 years. Maftakhara alayna bi shay'in. In 50 years, not once I heard the man whisper one virtue of himself. In 50 years, can you imagine this year? Sometimes you meet a man in five minutes and he, oh, yo, slowly brother, you, I know you're great, take it easy man, take it easy. You know, often I go and a brother tells me, oh, Sheikh, I love you man. When I feel depressed, I listen to your talks. When I see you, I feel nice. I said, I wish my wife can say that to me. <laughs> she wants to get deep. No, I mean, I don't have a problem. Wife is good, alhamdulillah. But what I mean is, the world can salute us. The world can salute us. A youngster came. He said, my mother-in-law, she loves me. She says, I'm like a son. My boss says, he's never seen a better employee. My neighbor says, I'm the best neighbor. It's just my mother's got an issue with me. I said, hang on, my brother. It's good you're kind to all of them, but your jannat is not on your mother-in-law, and be good to your mother-in-law. Let me qualify my statements. 
Be good to your neighbor, be good to your employee, em, em, employer, but your jannat is pending on your mom. If that's unresolved, your issue, your jannat is on hold. So he's writing a letter to his son, and he says, Umar ibn Abdullah, the son tells his father, listen, dad, you've come into office. Manage yourself, manage yourself right. Today, those that are around us, what kind of input are they giving us? What kind of input are we getting? Umar, let me mention another incident, my time is running out. Umar ibn Abdul Aziz needed to appoint someone as the governor. So he called, uh, as, as the judge of Basra. So he called his governor Adi ibn Artat. The man in office, he said, listen, we need to appoint someone. So now what do we do? He called Adi ibn Artat and he said that uh, we've got two prospective individuals, two suitable candidates, uh, Iyas ibn Muawiyah and Qasim ibn Rabi'ah. So please, you sit down with them and one of them got to embrace the post. One of them got to take office and we need to get them into power. So Adi ibn Artad said, Sam'an wa ta'atan ya Amir al-Mu'minin. I will oblige, I will comply. He gathers the two of them. He said, Inna Amir al-Mu'minin amarani an uwalli ahadakuma qada al-Basra. I've been given the task that one of you have to take the, the rule and the position of becoming the judge of Basra. Famadha tarayan. I beg for your undivided attention. What's your take on the matter? فَقَالَ كُلُّ وَاحِدٍ مِّنْهُمَا عَنْ صَاحِبِهِ أَنَّهُ أَوْلَى بِهَذَا الْمَنْصَبِ Each one said, listen, Qasim ibn Rabi'ah said, you can't ask for a better man than, than Iyas ibn Muawiyah. And Iyas ibn Muawiyah is saying, you can't ask for a better man than Qasim ibn Rabi'ah. وَذَكَرَ مِنْ عِلْمِهِ وَفَضْلِهِ مَا شَاءَ اللَّهُ أَنْ يَذْكُرْ And each one speaking about how great his partner is. I'm not going to use the word rival because there was no rivalry. His partner was, listen, he's a better man. Really, this is the man you, you, you should be putting into position. So Adi ibn Artad said, لَن تَخْرُجَ مِنْ هَذَا الْمَجْلِسِ حَتَّى تَحْسِمَ هَذَا الْأَمْرَ I mean, we're just going to buy time like this. You guys got to decide. Someone's got to agree. So Iyas ibn Muawiyah then takes the lead and he says, سَلْ عَنِّي وَعَنِ الْقَاسِمِ Oh, this is amazing. سَلْ عَنِّي وَعَنِ الْقَاسِمِ فَقِيهَيْ الْعِرَاقِ الحسن البصري ومحمد بن سيرين فهما أقدر الناس على التمييز بيننا. We can't resolve this. I'm saying he's more deserving. He's saying I'm more deserving. Today is the other way around. I'm saying I'm more deserving. He's saying he's more deserving. That's the world in which we are. Each man is. اجعلني على خزائن الأرض. اجعلني على خزائن الأرض. إني حفيظ عليم. There are certain times where you can praise yourself. And embrace the position because you know you are the most deserving person. Like Sayyidina Yusuf alayhi salam did it, but there's an explanation to it. So he said, let's resolve this here. We've got two great legends and great stalwarts. And they are, you know what, sage of the age and saintly people. Hassan Basri. Sal anni wa anil qasim faqihay al-Iraq. Muhammad ibn Sirin wal Hassan al-Basri. Muhammad ibn Sirin. Muhammad ibn Sirin was a great jurist of Islam. There are so many amazing things about him. He says, إِذَا أَرَادَ اللَّهُ تَعَالَى بِعَبْدٍ خَيْرًا جَعَلَ لَهُ وَاعِظًا مِنْ قَلْبِهِ يَأْمُرُهُ وَيَنْهَا When Allah intends guiding an individual, Allah activates his spiritual immunity, his immune system. When a person eats healthy food and is on this diet and, and you know what, uh, uh, it's, it's organic and it's not... Uh, uh, genetically modified and all that. My wife is on it, so I'm a little clued up. Uh, when they eat all these healthy and these seeds and all this good combination, when occasionally they eat unhealthy things, the system reacts to it. The system reacts, why? Because the body is very healthy and very aligned. When Allah intends good for a person, Allah activates his spiritual immunity. And his spiritual immunity becomes so strong and active and hassas and sensitive that as soon as he entertains the thought of evil, or fantasizes evil, or plans evil, his heart sends him distress signals, and his spiritual body becomes uneasy and restless. You cannot do this. You cannot go here. You cannot enter this. You cannot befriend here. You cannot deal like this here. It gives him constant messages, sends him signals. The plane is in, 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 in panic, distress signals to the control room. His inner cell sends him distress signals that this is not how you deal. So Muhammad ibn Sirid and Hassan Basri, go ask them. Now look at the vision of Iyas bin Muawiyah 
he consciously said that take Qasim ibn Rabi'ah and give him the post and if you want more clarity speak to these two people and he consciously highlighted the names of two scholars who Qasim ibn Rabia was connected to. Today he said, no, no, you speak to your, I speak to my mufti. I speak to my scholar, I speak to my cleric, I speak to my fraternity. And there's just division in the ummah, there's just bickering in the ummah, there is just fatwa shopping in the ummah. فَوَيْلٌ لِلَّذِينَ يَكْتُبُونَ الْكِتَابَ بِأَيْدِيهِمْ ثُمَّ يَقُولُونَ هَذَا مِنْ عِنْدِ اللَّهِ لِيَشْتَرُوا بِهِ ثَمَنًا قَلِيلًا Highlighting one of the flaws of the scholars of, of Bani Israel. Allah said they would write a verdict to suit, to impress, to appease the person who came to them and it would generate perks and virtues and revenue. فَوَيْلٌ لَهُمْ مِمَّا كَتَبَتْ أَيْدِيهِمْ وَوَيْلٌ لَهُمْ مِمَّا يَكْسِبُونَ May Allah guide our scholars, may Allah protect one and all. But honestly, things have been exploited to every level for personal uh, you know, agendas and personal motives. So he said, don't ask me, ask Qasim, ask Hassan Basri and Muhammad ibn Sirin. And Hassan Basri, you know his name was synonymous to piety. Just one of his attributes that were well known about him, he was a man between his private, his external and his internal life. There was absolute harmony. The other day somebody sent me this beautiful uh, little uh, WhatsApp clip. And in that the person is standing and he's got a telescope and he's looking, looking. And, and then, you know, the, 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 the phrase reads, what are you looking for? He said, not too many. If I can just find one person whose external and internal are the same, I'll be happy. If I can just find one person in the distance, I'm scanning the horizons, I'm looking far and wide, I can barely see one human whose outward and inward life, whose external and private life, whose public and private life is the same. And I'm afraid it's just, just nowhere to be found. That is why sometimes it's good to maintain a good distance and have respect for a person, then come up too close and the stench will kill you. The stench will kill you. So you maintain a reasonable distance and you have a good impression and good luck. Maintain that distance and keep that distance. When you look at the lives of Sahaba, Talha radiallahu anhu said, I seen that there was a woman in, 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 in Medina. She was elderly, she was aged, she was frail, she was senile. So I said, let me try and attend to her work. And I seen that Umar is coming there. Umar is coming in the odd hours. So my suspicion started playing with me and it started giving me negative whispers. I said, late hours, early morning, woman alone, Umar, what's this all about? What's this all about? It started playing with me. Anyway, one day I went up, I knocked on the door, the sister called me in. I said, sister, if you don't mind me asking, elderly age, ma, elderly lady, Sayyidina Umar is coming in the odd nights, what is this all about? She said, innahu ya'ti, he comes. And he attends to all my domestic chores. He cleans my house, makes my food, attends to everything. And before the flush of dawn, he leaves. Sayyidina Talha says, Thakilatka ummuka ya Talha, a'atharati umar tatatabba, woe be to you, O Talha. Are you trying to microscopically probe and look for the flaws of Umar? Well, let it be known to you, Umar sparkles on all levels. The closer you get, the more the fragrance, there's simply no stench. The closer you get to Umar, the greater the attraction, the more the aroma, the more the beauty. Come up close to his life, you're just so impressed at him. If you look at him at a distance, but I'm afraid if you look at me or you look at any other person by and large, then there is disparity, there's gross discrepancy. May Allah guide us. So one of the salient qualities of Hassan al-Basri, إِنَّهُمْ رُؤُنْ سَرِيرُهُ كَعَلَانِيَتِهِ his private and his external life were in harmony. Ask Hassan Basri and ask Muhammad ibn Sirin, فَهُمَّا أَقْدَرُ النَّاسِ عَلَى التَّمِيزِ بَيْنَنَا They are the rightful people to guide. So, now he realized this. Qasim ibn Rabi'ah, he realized this. That, that, that this is the, the, the plot of Iyas ibn Muawiyah. فَعَلِمَ الْقَاسِمُ أَنَّ إِيَاسًا أَرَادَ أَنْ يُوَرِّطَهُ 
He says, okay, okay, he's making reference to my scholars and I'm fond of them and they're fond of me. So probably they'll give a good reference. So he's getting me into this whole position. He says, wait, hang on, Adi ibn Artar, I have a counter opinion. I, imagine if, if that was our debates. He's more deserving, he's more deserving. You take this, you lead. Let me back off, you better off, you more deserving. Subhanallah, subhanallah. The sign of a believer is he will, he will, he will address your wrong to you openly and he will compliment you for your wrong as compliment you for your good. While the sign of a munafiq is Wadi Hasadin Yagta Buni Hai Sulam Yara Makani. Wadi Hasadin Yagta Buni Hai Sulam Yara Makani. Wa Yusni Salihan. A munafiq Wadi Hasadin Yagta Buni Hai Sulam Yara Makani. In my absence he will stab me. In my presence he will flatter me. تورعت أن أغتابه من ورائه وما هو إذ يغتابني متورع. It's the couplets of Muhammad ibn Idris al-Shafi'i رحمه الله. What does Qasim ibn Rabi'ah say? No, 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 no. Why go and engage Muhammad ibn Sirin and Hassan Basri? لا تسأل عني وعن القاسم أحدا. فوالله الذي لا إله إن إياسا غيره إن إياسا أفقه مني في دين الله وأعلم بالقضاء. I swear by Allah and I take an oath. This man is better. He's more deserving. Our hearts need to be clean, my brothers. I've been quoting these Urdu couplets in many of my talks. I'm not going to quote all, but I'll just quote one. Jab main chal nahi sakta tha, to log mujhe girne nahi dete the. Aur jab se chalna sika, to kadam kadam pe girate hai. Jab main chal nahi sakta tha, to log mujhe girne nahi dete the. How ironical is this world when I couldn't walk and I was taking my baby steps, then everybody was around me. Hold him, protect him, guard him. You must get him that shoe that supports his heel. He mustn't fall. He's a toddler. He's taking his baby steps. Hold him. And then I evolved and I matured and I took my milestones and then I could walk and run. And lo and behold, everybody wants to drop me. It's a cunning, it's a vicious, it's an evil, obnoxious world. Everybody has an agenda. Drop him, floor him, exploit him, abuse him, implicate him. When I couldn't walk, the whole world was there to insulate me. And when I could start walking, now cut him, expose him. We will stop his container. We'll block his deal. We won't let this happen. We'll show who's got the muscle. I'll put my weight. You put your weight. We'll see who pulls the strings. Well, what has happened to this ummah? What has happened to this ummah? We don't have the ability to pave the way to the prosperity of others. We don't have the muscle to see the prosperity that Allah throws in the lap of others. But that's what Allah gave him. Be happy on what Allah has decreed and ordained for him. Even that's become too much. So he says, don't ask anybody. I swear by Allah, he's a better person than me. Now, فَإِن كُنْتُ كَاذِبًا فَمَا يَجُوزُ لَكَ أَن تُوَلِّيَنِي أَلْقَضَى وَأَنَا أَقْتَرِفُ الْكِذْبِ وَإِن كُنْتُ صَادِقًا فَمَا يَجُوزُ لَكَ أَن تَعْدِلْ عَنِ الْفَاضِلِ إِلَى الْمَفْضُولِ I took an oath by Allah, he's better. If I'm speaking a lie in my oath, then how dare you make a liar a judge? And if I'm speaking the truth, then you have to oblige because he is better. Allahu Akbar. We go to extremes. We go to extreme to mobilize people. How many times do you hear that what there's an election? Suddenly people have been busloads. Brought from where and where and what? My name, my ballot, my, my favor, my... Do we understand that there is accountability to Allah? We have to stand and answer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For everything in how we conduct ourselves. When Sayyidina Yusuf took the treasures, we are liable for how we manage ourselves in our private capacity. Imagine when we hold public office. Imagine when we hold the funds of public. Shaykh Yusuf bin Nuri rahimahullah said, Let it not be that a man donates to your institution and earns his paradise by his donation, and you earn hell because you abused his donation. Let it not be that a man donates and earns his paradise and you exploit and abuse his donation and you end up in, it's an amana, trust. As I mentioned my opening words, taqwa, taqwa. That's the only thing that can govern us, that can regulate us, that can, can, can bring that, that, that you know, discipline into us. So if I'm speaking a lie, how dare you make me? Somebody told Imam Abu Hanifa to take a post. He said, by Allah I'm not deserving. He said, you're a liar. He said, well, I don't need any more proof. Why should you make a liar and a, 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 a person in position? So that, he took that in his own favor to discredit himself, to discount himself.
Why? Because there is accountability. We are answerable to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's the thing that needs to kick in us. My, my, how I manage my, my affairs with my spouse, with my children, with my employee. My Allah is watching. That employee is desperate. He won't answer because he's got no recourse. If he, if he opens his mouth, he loses his job. But I have an Allah above me. I have an Allah above me. Abu Mas'ud Badri says, I was rebuking, reprimanding, admonishing, chastising my servant. And I was about to flog him. And I was about to hit him. And the Nabi of Allah came and he said, Lallahu aqdaru alayka minka ala hadha al-ghulam. Abu Mas'ud, Allah has more authority over you than you have over your servant and your slave. I froze. I was embarrassed. I said, Oh Nabi of Allah, can, can I then just liberate him for the pleasure of Allah? The Messenger وسلم, said, You better do so, otherwise hell won't leave you. Ama law lam taf'al lala fahatka nar. Ama law lam taf'al lala fahatka nar. So then, when Adi ibn Artat heard this, he said, Well, this is what Iyas ibn Muawiyah has to say that, that he takes an oath. That, that uh, Qasim ibn Rabi'ah is taking an oath that, oh Iyas, you are a better person. So he didn't say, okay, okay, the game is over, give me the post. No, he says, إِنَّكَ جِئْتَ بِرَجُلٍ فَأَوْقَفْتَهُ عَلَى شَفِيرِ جَهَنَّمْ فَنَجَّى نَفْسَهُ مِنْهَا بِيَمِينٍ كَاذِبَ لَا يَلْبَثُ أَنْ يَسْتَغْفِرُ اللَّهَ مِنْهَا وَيَتُوبُ The truth be told, O Adi, you put the reins of authority on this man, he found himself in a catch-22. You literally put him on the brink of hell. So the only way he could rescue himself is he's taken a false oath. But I have no doubt he will make tawbah from the lie he spoke. Allahu Akbar. He's spoken a lie. He's a pious man. You know you get sometimes, some people are liars, but sometimes they speak the truth. And, 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 and often we get, we get uh, carried away by that one truth. We get, and that's the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi The hadith is in Bukhari. Let me, let me just share it with you quickly. Sayyidina Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu says, Read our deen, my brother. It's rich. There's so many morals, lessons, examples. It's brimming. Our deen is beautiful. We need to be connected to our text. Atani atin, an intruder intrudes. Fajala yahthu min at ta'am. He starts stealing from my food. I said, hang on, this is not my food. This is zakat money. Don't touch this. Don't touch this. If somebody comes by me and steals Allah forbid, I'll say, yeah, take from this. This is the masjid affair, it's not mine. Say, leave mine, say, go from there. فَجَعَلَ يَحْثُو He started stealing. So I said, hey brother, you're an intruder, you snatch in, I'll report you to the Nabi of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. فَشَكَا حَاجَةً وَعِيَالًا فَرَحِمْتُهُ فَخَلَّيْتُ سَبِيلًا He gave me a long sad story, and he said, I'm in a crisis, I'm really bad, I'm out, it's, it's dire, it's desperate. So I pitied him, I bought his tail and I said, okay, go, 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 go. He went. The next morning, and, and I just envy the Sahaba for this honor. You have a dream, you engage a scholar, you have a dream, you engage a senior. And Sahaba would report to the Nabi of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Imagine you had a dream in the morning, you just come up to the Nabi of Allah. Oh, Nabi of Allah, I need to talk to you. Whoa. Your, your brain freezes to, to begin to imagine the privilege that rested in the laps of Sahaba. Miqdad ibn Aswad was sitting, somebody passed by. Tuba lihatayn al aynayn allati allatayn ra'ata rasul Allah. Oh, Miqdad, allow me a moment. I just want to pass by and I just want to look at those eyes that looked at the Nabi of Allah daily. Today, where is that vision in our youth? Where is that aspiration? Who they idolizing? So, anyway, the Nabi of Allah, before I could tell him, he said, Ma fa'ala asiru kalbariha. Abu Huraira, what happened to the thief of yours last night? I said, oh, Nabi of Allah, good, you know it already. Huh? Wabi sallallahu anhu said, I came to Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, oh, Wabi sallallahu do you want to tell me why you came or must I tell you why you came? Jeeta tas'al anil bir. You came to ask the definition of virtue and vice. I said, spot on. He said, al-ithmu, al-birru matma'annat ilayhi al-nafs, watma'anna ilayhi al-qalb. While Islam is clear and explicit, on what is virtue and what is vice. But here the Nabi of Allah gives you a measurement from within yourself. Sometimes you need to consult yourself. You're traveling and there isn't anybody you can consult with. Is this food halal or not? You put in a, in, in a situation. Al-birru. Al, al al-birru, virtue is that, that you feel calm, you feel relaxed, you feel at ease. Well, ithmu ma haka fi sadrik. And a sin is that which leaves you uneasy, leaves you restless. 
leaves you doubtful. Even if people will give you a thousand verdicts, no, it's fine, it's okay, don't worry, all is okay. But you know within your heart it's leaving you restless. That's the definition. Obviously, where it's clear cut, you don't base it on your heart. But there are certain vague areas where sometimes you need to pronounce an opinion or have a, a, a decision made. And this is also something that can support you. What is the emotion of your heart provided you are Salim al Taba? As the scholars will tell us that you have a preserved nature, a preserved temperament, which is in harmony, in sync with the teachings of Quran and Sunnah, that it responds to Quran and Sunnah. So be it as it may, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi said, what happened to your captive and your thief? Oh, Nabi Allah, he came, he gave me a long sad story. Abu Huraira, Ama innahu kathabaka wa sayyahu. He's a liar, he's going to be back tonight. So I said, okay, he'll be back. Anyway, I go back, I said, oops, sleeping, and here he comes in again. Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu says, I intercept him. I, I apprehend him. What do you want here? He says, no, I'm in a crisis, I'm desperate, I don't have anything, please allow me some food. From, I pitied him and he convinced me and he took it and he went. The second day, I narrate that back to the Nabi of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Abu Huraira, he will be back again. And lo and behold, spot on as the Nabi of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, and absolutely, I often say that if a person wants to revert to Islam, amongst the many truth and everything of Islam is true, if you only look at the prophecies of Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that what the Nabi of Allah had prophesied 14 centuries ago, how it's staring us in our eyes, this is a clear proof of the veracity and the truthful nature of Islam. That how the Nabi of Allah had spelled it out, he had spelled it out. The narration is in Bayhaqi, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud narrates it, Marfu'an. يأتي على الناس الزمان A time will come يكون هلاك الرجل على يد زوجته وأبويه وولده A man will lose his iman and faith because of his most near and dear ones. I was in the Caribbean last year sometime for a program in Trinidad more specifically. I attended a conference. I spoke there. There was a brother who took a liking to me and then he was spending some time. He said, Shaykh, I need a favor from you. I said, I'm available. Whatever I can do, let's see what... He said, there's a brother that I want you to meet with. I said, okay, let's see, facilitate it and we'll go on. I said, what, what's, what's so amazing about this brother? He broke down, started crying. I said, sorry brother, have I offended you? Please, my apologies. He said, that brother invited me to Islam and he's left Islam. I am Muslim through the grace of Allah and the invite of this brother. And he showed me the light. Tragically, he has abandoned Islam. So it pains me, it galls me, it kills me to say the man who brought me into deen. Unfortunately, time, flight, commitments, and trying to facilitate, it just didn't. But I've continued imploring Allah in my humble du'as for his guidance. But that is the volatility of time. That is the times. Imagine the man who was instrumental in bringing someone into deen. Allah forbid and protect. He has left the fold of Islam. Recently, there were some of our students that had come from America who had studied and graduated. He said there was a young boy who I knew personally. His, ma his granny had taken ill and she was critically ill. And she had a lot of, you know, sickness and chronic conditions. And she was a very pious, saintly woman. And this woman in her illness came closer and closer to Allah. But this had an adverse effect on the grandson to say if my granny is so pious, yet in inverted commas, quote, she's suffering, why should I become pious? She in her illness found her creator and he because of the illness of his granny rebelled against his Allah. We ask Allah to hold our hearts. We ask Allah to keep us firm on deed. The Nabi of Allah used to make this dua, Ya muqallib al qulub thabbit qulubana. Oh, the turner of hearts, keep our hearts aligned, keep it focused. Sahaba said, Oh, Nabi of Allah, why do you implore Allah repeatedly? We won't ditch you, we won't launch you, we won't abandon you, we won't forsake you. We with you will walk the full road, we with you all the way. Bayana Rasul Allah, Alal manshati wal makra, Alal manshati wal makra. We pledged allegiance to the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. When situations are conducive and when the odds are adverse also. When the situation is pleasant and it's against us both. We were digging the trenches. We were digging the trenches. Ice cold. Read the narrations. Ice cold. And there was intense digging that was taking place for extended period. The Sahaba, نَحْنُ الَّذِينَ بَايَعُوا مُحَمَّدًا نَحْنُ الَّذِينَ بَايَعُوا مُحَمَّدًا we are the group of those individuals who have pledged our allegiance to Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. We will not change our mind or backtrack. And the Nabi of Allah, while they engage in, 
اللهم لا عيش إلا عيش الآخرة فاغفر الأنصار والمهاجرة Oh my Allah there is no life but the life of Akhirah And really my brother as a believer to be honest the real life is the life of Akhirah Under this ayah in the 12th juz وَلَئِنْ أَذَقْنَا الْإِنسَانَ مِنَّا رَحْمَةً and if we have to make man taste prosperity, in We make man taste prosperity or we make him taste adversity. Mufti Shafi Saf Rahmatullah magnifies the word adhaqna in his tafsir. And he says this ayah is a proof that there is no pleasure or pain. It's just the taste of both. In this world, there's no pleasure. It's the taste of pleasure. Pleasure is in Akhirah. There's no real pain. It's the taste of pain. The real pain is Akhirah. So coming back to the point, the Nabi of Allah said, the hearts are in the control of Allah. يُقَلِّبُهَا كَيْفَ yasha. Allah can turn the heart of any person at any time, at any moment. You see a man who was focused, diligent, and suddenly just derails, he just loses rhythm, he just loses focus, he just loses grip. And a man who was probably a delinquent, a black sheep, he was an outcast, and he rehabilitates himself and Allah. So we can never look with a condescending eye to anybody. We can never ever look with a condescending eye. Imam Ghazali's words come to my mind, so I just share it with you quickly, and I'll mention those two things and I'll wrap up inshallah. He said, when you look at a young child, then say to yourself, هَذَا عَبَدَ اللَّهَ قَبْلِي فَلَا شَكَّ أَنَّهُ خَيْرٌ مِّنِّي This is a child. Don't ignore him. Say to yourself, هَذَا لَمْ يَعْصِ اللَّهُ وَأَنَا عَصَيْتُهُ فَلَا شَكَّ أَنَّهُ خَيْرٌ مِّنِّي This is a child. He's pure. He's innocent. He's got no sins. Me, I've got so much sins. Definitely this child is better than me. وَإِذَا رَأَيْتَ كَبِيرًا And when you see an elderly old age man, you say to yourself, هَذَا هَذَا عبد الله قبلي. This man is fasting before I was born. He's reading Tarawih before I know myself. So definitely he's better than me. وإذا رأيت عالما. And when you see a scholar, you say هذا علم ما لم أعلم وبلغ ما لم أبلغ. This man is committed to his chest the whole Quran. I'm grappling with one Jews. How dare I create a comparison between myself and him? And when you see a sinner, you say to yourself هذا عصى الله بجهل وأنا عصيت الله بعلم فلا شك أنه خير مني. This man has sinned because he doesn't know any better. I have sinned. He has sinned out of ignorance. I have sinned out of knowledge. akbar. The consequences will be more severe on me on the day of Qiyamah. Wa idha ra'ayta kafir. And when you see a disbeliever, you say, Asa an Allah. There is a chance Allah will guide him prior to death. Wa amma ana fa'asa an yudhillani Allah. And probably Allah can lead me to slip and, and, and lose my focus. فَيَكُونُ هُوَ غَدًا مِنَ الْمُقَرَّبِينَ وَأَكُونُ أَنَا مِنَ الْمُبَعَدِينَ And he can stand up amongst the close and the near and dear ones to Allah. And I can stand up rejected to Allah. So we can never have a condescending eye on any person because we don't know what the fate holds the next moment. Anyway, this person, Sayyidina Abu Huraira intercepts him. And Sayyidina Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu says, Now I'm not going to release you because it's the third night in succession. So he says, Okay, Abu Huraira. Let me negotiate with you. Imagine a negotiation with a thief in the dead of night. You, you're having a discussion. You, 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 you're discussing. And what's the negotiation? He says, leave me. I will teach you some words of deen. Allah will be pleased with you. Sahaba was so willing to learn. They were ready to learn from all. إِذَا أَوَيْتَ إِلَى فراشك, When you retire to your bed, then read Ayat Al-Qursi. None will approach you, even the devil won't. I said, okay, I'll take those words and I'll move on with it. I release him, he conveys this to me. I meet the Nabi of Allah, Nabi Sallallahu said, Abu Huraira, what happened last night? Oh, Nabi of Allah was a long story now. What happened? He told me that he will convey to me certain words and if I read Ayatul Kursi at the time of bed, these are the virtues. Coming back to the words that I said, the Nabi of Allah said, Ama innahu qad sadaqaka wa huwa kathub. أَمَا إِنَّهُ قَدْ صَدَقَكَ وَهُوَ كَذُوبُ Oh Abu Huraira, he is a perpetual liar, but today he spoke the truth. He is by nature, he is a perpetual liar, كَذُوبُ If you do the linguistics of the words and you dissect it, by nature he is a perpetual liar, 
so some people, some people speak. Their nature is to lie. Occasionally they speak the truth. Coming back to that incident that we were talking about, what did Iyas bin Muawiyah say? Qasim bin Rabia is an honest man, but today he's spoken a lie. Today he's spoken a lie, and I have no doubt that he will repent from his tawbah when he said, I am better than him. When Sayyidina, Abdul, Sayyidina Umar was in the throes of death, then Abdullah ibn Abbas came to him and said, Oh Umar, everybody at the time of death goes into panic, goes into spasm, goes into anxiety, but you can relax. You know Allah is happy with you. Abdullah ibn Abbas came to him and said, Relax. I'm paraphrasing here, but the long and short of that, that was, Oh, oh Umar, relax. For you it's, adla. You brought a new definition to justice. You ruled, you executed, you were noble, you were pious. When Sayyidina Abu Bakr, uh, delegated Sayyidina Umar radiallahu anhu as the governor, like Abdullah ibn Abba, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu said, it's in tafsir uh, ibn Kathir, Afrasun nasi thalatha. Throughout history, three people stand out in terms of wisdom. They are three wise people. One was the minister of Egypt when he said to his wife, Akrimi mathwahu asa ayyanfa'ana. When he brought Sayyidina Yusuf home, he said, look after this man. This is not an ordinary boy. See him well. This is a good boy. And yes, he was a wise man. He's seen the vision of Yusuf. When Sayyidina Yusuf came into power, we talk of people who, who are selfless and not selfish. For the entire seven years that there were famine, in the palace only one meal was cooked. So that those that were in the palace and those that were outside, their hunger levels were the same. Honestly, my brother, ask yourself, and I must ask myself, my one holiday, and I'm, I'm being honest with myself, and it pricks me and it bothers me. My one holiday and my lavish spending on my children and my flying and my accommodation can be the wealth and can be the provision of a family for an entire year. How do I reconcile? How do I digest? How do I answer my creator when around me so much is happening? I continue having my lavish vacations. No incognizant, I quote these words of, of, of Uwais Qarni often, and may Allah fill his grave with nur. He was an amazing person. Whenever the sun used to set, the last piece of bread he had in his possession, he used to give it in charity. And then he used to say, Allahumma mamma taju'an fala tu'akhidni bihi. Allah, I empathize with anyone and everyone who is in poverty and penury. But don't hold me liable, Allah. My last piece of bread was given to you, Allah. So I sympathize, but don't take me to task. And whatever surplus clothes he had, he would give it in charity. Allahumma mamma ta'uryanan. Allahumma, look in your cupboard, let me look in my cupboard. Look at my shoes, look at your shoes. Look at my kids, look at your kids. Look at recently, just before Ramadan, a brother who's doing some tara um, feeding in, in one of the informal settlements. He called me, he said, I'm doing tarawih in an informal settlement. They don't have the privilege of scholars visiting them. Would you oblige? I said, how can I tell you no, my brother? The night preceding Eid now, how can I tell you no? Faith had it that that night in land there was no lights. And that always happens to us. First Ramadan, first you know, Eid and the lights black out. Anyway, you go there, there are no lights. There are no lights. And then I gave a talk and it was freezing cold. Well, the windows are open. There's nothing warm about the environment. This is literally just a hop over, just a hop over. And then hampers were given and we stood outside and with the torch on the phone we give in and he's asked me to give it and I'm giving it and then there's a bit of a squabble and uh, he's pulling and that one is taken and I asked the brother, for 20 years you're doing it, how, how have you managed yourself, how have you persevered? He said, we buy for our kids shoes for 2000 and they still squabble, yeah, they're squabbling over 100 rand voucher, allow them that space. And I said, brother, I, I, point taken, point taken, point taken. Sayyidina Yusuf, when he came, who were three wise people? One was the minister who said, Akrimi Maswa, look after Sayyidina Yusuf. He's sitting on his throne. His blood brother siblings come in. The very ones who plotted his assassination and dropped him in the well. Today one brother cannot see the growth of another brother. Snub him openly. Cannot see the prosperity of another brother. Sayyidina Yusuf is sitting on the throne, his brothers have come in. And Allah can reverse the tables, my brother. Don't be proud, don't be arrogant. None of us are anchored in the seat of luxury and comfort perpetually. Allah can flip the scenarios at any time. Look at the political landscape of the world and it will speak volumes to you. Just to expedite. 
The Quran paints an image. He's sitting on his throne, his brother's walking, he identifies each one. And they don't recognize him because they thought his chapter had ended and Allah elevated him on the throne. And Allah puts him in the position of power. And then they come and it's a long story short. And then he calls his advisors and he calls his employees and he calls his workers. He says, you see those people that have come in, they are my brothers. You take the money from them in principle, give them their grain, give them everything what they want. And then, اِجْعَلُوا بِضَاعَتَهُمْ فِي رِحَالِهِمْ What did they do? Mufti Shafiza rahmatullahi has written this. And it's a topic of its own. That if your son rebels and he revolts, and may Allah protect our youth, it doesn't feature in the vocabulary of a Muslim that I will disown you. I just was, and I asked you to make dua. I've been dealing with two very close cases of drug at the moment. I was driving back the other day. And the sister, a cousin of mine called me and she said, someone wants to speak to you urgently. And I said, it's fine. And may Allah reward my wife. And I make this dua consciously for her because constantly I'm intruded uh, by these calls. And, and I try and there's a balance I need to strike. And there's a call and, and somebody who's, who's desperately screaming out. And the sister called and she says, uh, you know, my son has relapsed for the 15th time. And now me and my husband are at the crossroads. Uh, he says it's time we call it a day and we let him go. And I feel that, you know what, end of the day is my son, it's cold, it's outside. I know I'm tired, we've exhausted all avenues, back and forward, what's the way forward? And I said, sister, I told you I will give you two minutes, but talk to me as much as you want to. If I can't give you an ear, how do I face my Allah? If I can't listen to your pain, if I can't listen to your pain and sympathize with you. So I said, let, let's, let's speak to the boy. But disowning him does not feature in the vocabulary of a Muslim. Mufti Shafi Saf has spelled that out. The brothers of Yusuf had committed five major crimes. They lied to their father. He lost his vision. They made their brother into a slave. They sold him. They dropped him in a well. They fabricated a lie. They stained his garment with false blood. Five major sins. And in that he writes, when we say Anbiya were tested, we commonly associate the test of a Nabi to adversity. Physically ill, monetary challenged, financially challenged, restrained. We seldom interpret the challenges of prophets as rebellious children. So prophets were tried and challenged. We don't interpret it they had rebellious children. But Sayyidina Yaqub left the door of communication open. And I speak with the cap of a father of three kids that are of teenagers. And I ask you to pray for my youth and I pray for your youth. May Allah guide our youth. From their eyes they're living in turbulent times. They're living in, but youth phone me every day and I speak to them. And I try to strike the balance. It's not an easy thing in the position in which they find themselves. So Sayyidina Yusuf knows, is cognizant, is aware of what his brothers had done to him. Yet he says, this is my blood. It doesn't mean if I'm in power, I'm going to abuse them, give them their money. How can I exploit and milk my own brothers in their desperation? And then the tale goes on. And this is what I want to mention here. Allah puts the thought in my mind. That finally, at one point, they realize that this is the king and, and the rest of it. They say, Inna naraka min al O king, you appear to be a very kind man, a very noble man. And yet when Sayyidina Yusuf was in the jail, the inmates of the jail said to him, Nabbi'na bita'awili, inna naraka min al-muhsineen. O king, please interpret our dream to us, you're a kind man. And the scholars said, that he's a noble man. That he stood out with nobility when he was an inmate in a jail. And he still continued the legacy of nobility when he was elevated to the throne and he was sitting as the king and the ruler. It's easy to greet when you're an ordinary worker. But how many of us have the courage to greet or talk humbly and simply when Allah has given us muscle and cloud, when Allah has given us wealth? There's a good brother I know, I visit his office often. On his office he's got notes there, don't forget, don't forget. One day my gaze strayed and I started looking at it. And I looked at him and he teared. And we have a personal relation. I nudged him, I said, what's this all about? He said, no, I keep this note in front of me on my desk. In 1970 you never owned a car. In 1975, this was your salary. This was the house you loved. Remember this. And every day I look at this before I start my work, before my employees come into my office, before I issue my decrees, before I dispatch my envoys, before my containers arrive. I say, listen to this and look at this and remember. So who was a wise man? 
it was the man who recognized the talent of Sayyidina Yusuf alayhi salatu wasalam. The second wise person was the daughter of Shu'ayb, Ista'jir. Inna khayra man ista'jarta al-qawiyyul ameen. Inna khayra man ista'jarta al-qawiyyul ameen. That, oh my father, employ Musa. He's a man, he has two amazing qualities. He's strong and he's trustworthy. And to lead, what did Sayyidina Yusuf say? Inni hafizun alim. I have knowledge and I have wisdom. And the third person whose fortitude needs to be celebrated was Sayyidina Abu Bakr when he selected Umar as his leader. When he selected Umar as his leader, the vision of Abu Bakr. So somebody said to Abu Bakr, Abu Bakr, you made Umar in charge, what you'll tell Allah? Meaning that Umar has so much muscle and clout and power. When you are, when, when you are in charge, when Umar will have free reigns, what will he do? And Sayyidina Abu Bakr said, Abillahi tukhawifunini. Abillahi tukhawifunani. Are you trying to scare me about Allah as if I don't fear my Allah and I don't know Umar? By Allah, I will say to Allah, I have made the most deserving person in charge. فَإِنْ عَدَلَ فَذَلِكَ ظَنِّي فِي If he lives up to my dream, then those are my hopes and my, my expectations. وَإِنْ بَدَّلَ فَالْخَيْرَ أَرَدْتُ And if he distorts and he changes, then Allah knows my intentions were noble. There were no trace of nepotism in it. To wrap up on that note, coming back to that incident, what did Adi ibn Artad say to Iyas ibn Muawiyah? إِنَّ مَنْ يَفْهَمُ مِثْلَ فَهْمِكَ هَذَا لَجَدِيرٌ بِالْقَضَى حَرِيٌ بِهِ You could see into that man's statement and understand it and you could spell it out. Surely you the man to take the office and I make you in charge. And then Iyas ibn Muawiyah was given that position of power and authority and he ruled and he brought a different definition. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bring favorable conditions to our country as it's going through this phase. We ask Allah to put good people in positions who lead our institutions, our organizations, our masajid. Those that are in it, may Allah reward you, may Allah give you strength. It's not an enviable, but surely somebody needs to take it. May Allah reward you, may Allah bless you. May Allah give you the strength to, to deliver in the position in which you are. And each one of us, whether we wear the cap of a guardian or a father, or a parent, or an elder sibling, we have a responsibility amongst us. May, may Allah allow taqwa to govern us in each thing. Wa salli Allahumma wa sallim ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'in. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa salatu wa salamu ala ashrafil anbiya wal mursaleen. Sayyidina wa maulana Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'in. Allahumma laka alhamdu kulluhu wa laka shukru kulluhu wa ilayka yurja'u al-amru kulluhu ala niyatuhu wa sirru. Allahumma la nuhsi thana'an alayk anta kama athnayta ala nafsik. O oh, most kind, most loving, most gracious, most merciful Allah, we are grateful to you that you have made us amongst those that recite the kalima. O oh, Allah, make us proud about our faith, O oh, Allah. Let us not be apologetic about our faith, O oh, Allah. Let us exhibit the faith in its pristine purity, O oh, Allah. Let us not distort or corrupt or give a wrong effect, a reflection. Let us mirror Islam correctly in a wholesome way, O oh, Allah. O oh, Allah, make us good partners to our spouses. Make us good parents to our children. Make us, make us good children to our parents. Make us good siblings to fellow siblings. Make us good humans to fellow humans and good citizens to fellow citizens, O oh Allah. Allah, you allow for noble, pious, righteous people to govern and rule our country and the world, O oh Allah. O oh Allah, there is just this massacre, killing, mayhem, anarchy, lawlessness, butchers, autocrats, dictators, O oh Allah, tyrants, O oh Allah. O oh Allah, we ask you to stop their control and their aggression, O oh Allah. Allah, Sayyidina Musa said to you, May Allah, Rabbana, innaka aataita fir'aun wa mala'ahu zina. وَأَمْوَالًا فِي الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا رَبَّنَا لِيُضِلُّوا عَنْ سَبِيلِكَ That, oh my Lord, the reason of the tyranny of Pharaoh was the extended grace and respite that you gave to him. رَبَّنَا اطْمِسْ عَلَىٰ أَمْوَالِهِمْ وَاشْدُدْ عَلَىٰ قُلُوبِهِمْ And when you seized the wealth of Pharaoh, oh Allah, that was the time his tyranny ended. Oh Allah, we ask you, oh Allah, to stop the hands of the butchers and the killers, oh Allah. Allah, let peace reign in the Middle East, oh Allah. You make it easy for our brothers in Turkey, in Syria, in Iraq, and in other parts of the world, Allah. Allah, as we go through severe cold, we're grateful of the warmness that you have given us, oh Allah. Give us the ability to reach out to those who have less than us, oh Allah. Allah, give us the ability to give from what you've given us, oh Allah, and make our hisab easy for us, oh Allah. Allah, we, we, we snug into a warm bed, we cuddle up into a warm bed, Allah. Orthopedic for our bed, soft for our body, oh Allah. Warm for our, our external, Allah. Hot showers, underfloor heatings, Allah. Yet across the 
road, there are people, Allah, who have no roof over their head, Allah. Allah, how will this play out in your court, my Allah? How will you value this or evaluate this, Allah? We are liable, we are responsible. Forgive us, Allah. We have failed miserably. We have performed dismally, O oh Allah. Allah, guide our youth, my Allah. O oh Allah, guide our youth. This is the scourge of infidelity. Allah, there's this onslaught on them, Allah. A little tap into the phone and there are a thousand websites that just drive them and link them and take them, Allah. Allah, bring commitment and loyalty in our marriages, Allah. Allah, those that are involved in illicit relationship, those that are unfortunately perpetrating zina, Allah. Allah, you grant them deliverance from this crime instantly, Allah. Allah, there are just too many a marriages that are suffering due to disloyalty, Allah. There are too many a partners that are living in silence due to other obligations or commitments, Allah. Let our marriages be wholesome and honest, sincere and transparent, Allah. Allah, those of our youth that are drug dependent, Allah. Those of our adult males that are drug dependent. Those of our marriages that are breaking up because of this, this, this curse, oh Allah. Allah you free our youth from them Allah Allah those that are selling this promoting them you guide them Allah you guide them my Allah Allah is at the cost of the detriment of society killing the fabric of our society Allah those that have chronic conditions sudden tragedy sudden illness oh Allah you grant them instant cure Allah you above the law you above the medical explanation you above all other things Allah cure is yours decree is yours you are the ultimate we ask you to cure oh Allah oh Allah we ask from you those of our near and dear ones that have moved on oh Allah Allah let, let tranquility descend on their souls Allah at this moment in this gathering as we speak about you let them also enjoy the tranquility of this humble gathering and the richness of the talks of Allah and his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam oh Allah we ask from you all the good that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had asked and we ask thy divine protection against all evils from which Nabi alayhi salatu wa salam had asked protection Allah those of our brothers who are in any position of authority, who are spearheading in any organization, who are forerunners in any, Allah guide them, Allah protect them, Allah. Give them strength, give them vision, give them ability, Allah. And those that are abusing their position, forgive them and guide them, Allah. Put good people to rule and govern over us and take charge of our affairs, O oh Allah. Allahumma inna nasaluka min khayri ma sa'alaka minhu abduka wa nabiyuka Muhammadun sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Wa na'udhu bika min kulli sharri masta'adhaka minhu abduka wa nabiyuka Muhammadun sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Anta al تعان وعليك البلاغ ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم سبحان ربك رب العزة عما يصفون وسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله by Islamic media CDs CD-ROMs MP3s and DVDs at soakislam.com secure online shopping available 24 hours a day that's soakislam S-O-U-K-I-S-L-A-M dot com This audio is brought to you by Muslim Central. Please consider donating to help cover our running costs and future projects by visiting www.muslimcentral.com forward slash donate. Hmm.